And as you do, I decree, based on Job twenty-two twenty-eight, 28, we shall decree a thing and it shall be established. I decree that God is bringing you into a wealthy place. Psalms 66 and 12. I decree wealth and riches in your house. Psalms 112 verse 3. I decree gold and silver and glory coming to your house. Um, Haggai 2, 7 through 10. I decree the blessing of the Lord makes rich and that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for you. Proverbs 10, 22 and Proverbs 13, 22. I decree that God would do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. Ephesians 3, 20. I decree all your needs are met according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 19. I decree that you will learn to profit. God will teach you to profit. Isaiah 48, 17. That you'll break forth on the right hand and on the left. Isaiah 54 and 3. I decree that God will send you prosperity now. Psalms 118, verse 25. I decree the storehouses of goodness will be open to you. Psalms 31, 19. And that the windows and floodgates of heaven will be opened over your life. Malachi 3 and 10. I decree over your life more grace, James 4, 6, abundance of grace, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God will multiply your seed sown, 2 Corinthians 9, 10. I decree Psalms 23, no lack, green pastors, a table before you in the presence of your enemies, goodness and mercy, your head being anointed with oil, your cup running over, overflow, overflow, overflow for your life. I make these decrees. I decree them over you by faith. I speak them and agree with you that they shall manifest in your life. I also decree great and mighty things being revealed and done for you according to Jeremiah 33 and 3. Father, I thank you for the things that you're doing for your people. I decree over your finances, your business, your accounts, multiplication, increase, abundance, and quantum release. Let it be your portion in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I do want to remind the members of Crusaders Church, I'll be in service Saturday, 3821 South Michigan at 2 p.m. Uh, looking forward to ministering again. And um, it's been a great, great time. The last couple of weeks I've been there ministering and looking forward to the members of Crusaders Church joining me and Kathy Summers Kelly and the ASAP Band for Praise and Worship for Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m. Again, the address is 3821 South Michigan. The new book should be out hopefully this week. I, I, I'm really pushing it. Um, I want to get this book out, Deliverance and Healing from Madness, 26 chapters on the subject of madness. Now in the book, I have a chapter on when kings go mad, but I wrote another book specifically on the subject of when kings go mad or madness in leadership. Some leaders actually do go mad because of power, because of money, uh, because of bad doctrine, because of pride. There are many ways that you can lose it as a leader. And again, this message is not to disparage leaders. I am a leader. I value leader, leadership. I value godly men and women who are humble, holy, clean, who minister with wisdom, compassion, love, who have humility. I honor that. But there is a danger there is a danger that a leader can go astray, can get off. Often too many leaders have gone astray and they've allowed themselves to go mad. Now, madness, biblical madness, I'm not talking about clinical madness because what psychiatrists and doctors deem madness is, is something different. It, it, it may be a part of madness, but just because you're not hus uh, hospitalized or in, in put in institutionalized does not mean you don't have biblical madness. Biblical madness is any behavior, action, thought, pattern, lifestyle that is self-destructive, that hurts or harms oneself or hurts or harms others. That's my biblical definition of madness. It's, it's, it's moral insanity. It is confusion. It is chaos. Any action behavior, thoughts, talk, activities that are self-destructive. Notice how many people in life do things that bring self-destruction, whether it's addiction, whether it's sexual sin, 
whether it's pride, uh, whether it's covetousness, idolatry, witchcraft, sorcery, divination, that end up destroying themselves. Well, it, 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 it's mad to destroy yourself. That is not sanity. That is not a sound mind. That is madness. That is confusion. That is chaos. And so biblical madness is foolishness. Uh, the, the, the madness is connected to folly in Ecclesiastes 9 and 3. I encourage you to look that verse up, read it. Ecclesiastes 9 and 3, the preacher sees folly and madness. It's foolishness. It's when you're doing things that are foolish, self-destructive, harmful. And, and, and the world is full, full of it. Whether it's in the, in the, in the entertainment area, whether it's in the social area, whether it's in the religious area, the government area, the economic area, people doing things that are just insane. All you have to do is look at social media today, look at the world today, look at the news today, and you see the world is full of madness. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A sound mind is a disciplined, peaceful uh, mind, whole mind that is saved. A, a saved person should have a sound mind. A, a salvation delivers you from madness. Let me say that again. Salvation delivers you from madness. Think of some of the crazy things you did before salvation. When you look back, you say that was insane. But thank God for his mercy. God saved you. So madness is something that attacks everyone. Before you say, I don't have any of this in my life. Madness can attack anyone. There's a whole group of demons that operate with madness. Insanity, confusion, chaos, double-mindedness, instability. Uh, lunacy, uh, self-deception, self-delusion. Uh, the, the, these are all spirits that operate with madness. And so let's be delivered from it. Let's have a sound mind, especially if you are a leader. Nothing, nothing worse than having a person over people that is descended into madness. Now we see this in Daniel chapter four with King Nebuchadnezzar because of his pride God allowed him to go mad. And so it shows us that God is the one that really keeps your mind. He stepped out one day on his terrace, his balcony, and said, it's not this great Babylon that I have built. Immediately, he lost his mind. For seven years, he crawled around on all fours like an animal, like a beast. His, his, his fingernails grew out like claws. His hair on his body became like feathers. A king. A great king, the, 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 the greatest king of his time, who had, was ruling over the whole known world at that time, Babylon, went mad, went mad. God restored him, restored his mind. And when he came back, he began to worship and praise and give honor to God. It is one of the most amazing stories in scripture. Read it in Daniel chapter four. But before that happened, there was a warning before the madness. You know, when people go mad, often there is a warning. God gives you a warning before it happens. Uh, in a dream, a vision, someone warns you. Someone tries to tell you, you're, you're going astray, man. This is crazy. This is insane. Don't do this. You're going to lose it. And often people don't listen to the warning. Here's the warning. Daniel gives it to him. In Daniel chapter 4 and verse 27. Write that verse down, Daniel 4 and 27. The prophet Daniel offers King Nebuchadnezzar uh, a sobering yet compassionate counsel after interpreting the king's troubling dream. This verse serves as a critical moment where Daniel implores the king to change his ways and seek righteousness in order in, uh, to avoid the severe consequences predicted in the dream. So Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of a large tree going to heaven with branches that cover everything and all the animals come and, and the birds come and live in the branches, but then the tree is cut down. The tree represents his growth, it, his height, but it also represents pride. Him being cut down represents humility. And Daniel interprets the dream and then warns him. 
that if you make a change, this can be avoided. The verse can be broken down in a several key parts to better understand Daniel's message. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Daniel begins by humbly offering his advice to Nebuchadnezzar, indicating his respect for the king despite the gravity of his message. Although he is uh, fully aware of the impending judgment revealed in the dream, Daniel approaches the situation with humility and a spirit of concern by saying, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Daniel shows both reverence and urgency, hoping the king will heed his warning. His respectful approach exemplifies how to speak truth to those in authority with both courage and kindness. Notice Daniel didn't go in there saying, I'm without a word for you, king. You better listen. I, I The Lord rebuke you for... No, he went in humbly. Sometimes when you're dealing with leaders, you have a word of counsel for them, a warning for them. Do it humbly. They have a, they have a position. Um, do it humbly. Daniel approaches him very humbly. And he says, break off thy sins by righteousness. Here Daniel calls Nebuchadnezzar to repentance. The phrase break off thy sins suggests a decisive, intentional action to turn away from sinful practices. This is not a mild suggestion, but a call to renounce his past actions completely. Daniel identifies righteousness as the remedy for sin, Im implying that the, re the repentance involves a radical change in behavior and values. For Nebuchadnezzar, whose reign was marked by pride, self-glorification, ruthless control, righteousness meant acknowledging God's authority, acting justly, and ruling in alignment with divine standards. He says, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Now, this is interesting. God, uh, Daniel tells them specifically what to do to change this situation. Show mercy to the poor. I, I, I find that very interesting. That showing mercy to the poor can be a sign of righteousness. It is in scripture. Showing mercy to the poor is a sign of righteousness and justice. Daniel moves from a general concept of, of righteousness to a specific action showing mercy to the poor. This advice implies that Nebuchadnezzar, who had been characterized by oppression or neglect of those in need. So a part of his, his, his pride as a leader was that he did not treat the poor well. He did not treat the oppressed well. As a matter of fact, he oppressed them. That was one of his sins. His pride, his ruthlessness, his arrogance was showing no compassion and no concern for those in his kingdom that were oppressed and weaker than him. Anytime a leader becomes oppressive, becomes proud, becomes arrogant, begins to look down upon people, begins to oppress them, shows no mercy to those who are less fortunate, uh, has have left, have less, have, has le have left or have less power, that's, that's, that is grievous in the sight of God. By urging him to show compassion, Daniel highlights a fundamental biblical principle. True repentance involves more than personal piety. It requires, care, it requires caring for others, especially the vulnerable. The call to mercy aligns with recurring theme in scripture where God expects rulers to use their power to uplift and support those marginalized. Isaiah 117, Micah 6 and 8. Daniel is essentially telling Nebuchadnezzar that genuine repentance must be evident through acts of kindness, justice, and mercy toward those who are less fortunate. It may be, he says, the lengthening of thy tranquility. Daniel concludes with a hopeful yet conditional statement, the phrase, it will, it may be indicates that while there is hope for God's mercy, it is not guaranteed. This conditional phrase reflects the principle that God's judgment is often tempered by his mercy, especially where there is genuine repentance. However, Daniel leaves the outcome in God's hands, underscoring the king's need to act without a sense of entitlement to avoid judgment by stating 
a lengthening of thy tranquility. Daniel is in Implying that Nebuchadnezzar's peace, stability, and prosperity depend on his repentance and, re and, and reformation. What are the lessons we can learn from this? The, this verse teaches several important lessons about repentance, mercy, and the nature of God's judgment. The call to repentance is urgent and tangible. Daniel's counsel to Nebuchadnezzar highlights the necessity of repentance in practical terms. True repentance is not just an internal change of heart, but must be reflected in actions. For Nebuchadnezzar, this meant adopting righteousness and showing mercy to those who were most affected by his rule. Justice and compassion as evidence of repentance, Daniel links righteousness with justice toward the poor, which reveals the biblical principle that compassion and mercy are integral to a life aligned with God. Repentance calls not only for re renouncing not only for renouncing sin, but for actively working to correct injustices and uplift others, especially the poor. God's mercy and judgment. The conditional if in this verse suggests that God's judgment can sometimes be uh, averted or delayed by genuine repentance, but it also serves as a warning. While God is merciful, there is an urgency in Daniel's message showing that repentance cannot be delayed indefinitely. It reflects the biblical principle that God is both just and merciful, willing to relent when there is genuine humility and change, but also willing to allow judgment if there is no transformation. For leaders, Daniel's message emphasizes the importance of ruling justly, of ruling justly and caring for less, the less fortunate. Nebuchadnezzar was a powerful ruler, yet his position demanded responsibility, humility, and compassion. Leaders today can draw from the principle recognizing that authority and influence are meant to be exercised for the good of others, not for self-exaltation um, or oppression. On a personal level, this verse reminds us that repentance is more than confessing wrongdoings. It is about actively pursuing righteousness and demonstrating compassion. True transformation requires a change in attitude, behavior, and priorities marked by humility before God and genuine concern for others. Daniel 4.27 is a powerful call to repentance and reformation. It reveals that while God may allow judgment. He also offers a path to mercy through repentance and righteous action. By urging Nebuchadnezzar to adopt justice and showing mercy, Daniel points to the kind of godly leadership that is concerned with righteousness and compassion. Ultimately, this verse serves as a reminder of the transformative power of repentance and the mercy of God and extend, he extends to those who humbly turn to him. Now, evidently, uh, Nebuchadnezzar did not heed the warning. He did not repent. And as a result, he went mad. His pride drove him to madness. And the judgment of God upon him was madness. When leaders go mad, when kings go mad, it's a danger. Pride, self-exaltation, no mercy, to the poor, no most mercy to the hurting, no compassion, being cruel, being hard, no compassion, pride, arrogance, idolatry. These are things that can lead to madness in the scripture. And again, it doesn't mean that you completely lose your mind. It just means that your mind becomes unstable, unbalanced, confusion is the result, chaos is the result. It is something often that I don't think we think of when we think about sin and pride and rebellion and haughtiness and arrogance and idolatry and covetousness and greed. We just think maybe it's a sin. God will forgive you. You know, you can go to hell for it, but we don't think that this affects the mind. It can cause you to go mad. How many leaders have you seen that when you look at them, you, you say it's like they've lost their minds. You hear them preaching, you hear them teaching saying things and doing things, their lifestyle. You say, this is not the person I knew before. They've lost it. They've gone mad. They're no longer 
temperate in their mind. They no longer have a sound mind. They're saying and doing things that are completely unreasonable, illogical. They're treating their family, their wife, their loved ones in a way they're committing sinful acts. They've gone crazy. They become proud, arrogant, vain, greedy, covetous. It happens more often than not. And it happens to leaders. So if you're a leader, be very careful. Walk in humility. Uh, walk in righteousness. Walk in godly. Guard your mind. Uh, don't descend into madness. Believe God for a sound mind. Don't play around with sin, rebellion, pride, arrogance, idolatry, witchcraft, divination. Because you can go mad. You can experience madness, confusion in your personal life, your ministry, your business, your finances, your family, your marriage. Madness and confusion can result. It is a serious matter that we see throughout scripture. And there's several people I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about King Saul. He went mad. I'm going to talk about kings like Ahaz and Manasseh. Even Solomon descended into madness. He began to worship idols and burn incense to false gods. That was mad after having a visitation from God as a young man and be given wisdom and honor and riches. He descended into madness. Jezebel was a mad woman. She was full of murder, idolatry. She was trying to kill all the prophets, her and Ahab. That was madness. That's insanity. That is not normal. That is lunacy. That is confusion. That is chaos. That is mental instability when you're killing and murdering prophets, when you're harming others, that when, when you're guilty of genocide. That's, that's madness. That is not normal. We see so much madness today and we try to make it like it's normal. It's not normal. It's not the normal way to think. So many sinful practices in our nation. So many things are happening in our nation. So many things are being taught as normal. It's madness. It's confusion. Don't ever allow yourself to make madness normal. Madness is not normal. It is abnormal. It is not the proper way to think. We have to have a sound mind. The scripture tells us in the book of Philippians how to think, what to think on things that are true and just and righteous and pure. The normal way, the godly way, the way people think is not normal. The killings, the murders, the, the, the sexual sin in our nation. It's, it's not normal. It's, it's a, it's a sinful mind. It's a corrupt mind. It's a carnal mind. It's a fleshly mind. It's a mind separated from God. Any mind that is separated from God will end up in madness. Let me say that again. Any mind that is separated from God will end up in madness to some degree or another. The only thing that delivers from madness is repentance and salvation, a return to sanity. So I pray that you would have the spirit of a sound mind, that you would have the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, the fear of the Lord, that you will walk in God's wisdom, that you'll not be foolish, that you'll not be self-destructive, but that you'll have a clear, clear, a clear mind of clarity, balance, calm, peaceful, no confusion, chaos in your mind, and that you will not go mad, especially if you are a leader and who much is given, much is required. Let's be very careful leaders that we stay sound in the way we think and not allow the enemy to cause madness to come into our lives. Father, I pray for every leader that is watching. Let humility be your portion. Let righteousness, godliness, the way you treat people justly, walking in the fear of God. As Second Samuel 23 and 3, David said, the Lord showed him that if you are a ruler, you must, you must act justly in the fear of God. Be righteous. Treat people right. Treat them fair. Treat them kind. Don't use your position to abuse people, control people, manipulate people, beat people, oppress people, and be kind and be gracious and be compassionate and treat people kindly and be just and walk in righteousness. Father, I speak that over those that are watching today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, if you want to sow and bless what I'm doing, we do reach out to the poor through this ministry, our water projects. I'll reach the street children, different parts of the world. We minister in some of the poorest countries in the world. If you want to sow, uh, go to Cash App at AJE Global. 
AJE Global, and PayPal at Apostle JE the number one. Apostle JE the number one. And um, thank you for your gifts, your giving, your your kindness, your generosity. And again, I decree favor, grace, blessing, prosperity, and abundance over your life. We'll continue this tomorrow when kings go mad. We're going to continue this conversation in Clubhouse. And um, as always in departing, thank you for sharing. Thank you for giving. Thank you for sowing. And until tomorrow, the same time on the porch, God bless you and double shalom. God bless.